Thanks for joining us for Election 2019, the Las Cruces Mayoral Forum. I'm Fred Martino. Thanks to the NAACP, PFLAG, and the League of Women Voters of Southern New Mexico for co-sponsoring this event. Our format is very simple. Candidates have up to one minute to answer each question, and they should not mention any opponent in their answer. The mayoral candidates joining us in ballot order are Jorge Sanchez, Greg Smith, Isabella Solis, Mike Tellez, Alexander Page Baca Frescas, Bev Courtney, Jesusita Dolores Lucero, Bill Matisse, Ken Miyagashima, and Gina Ortega. And joining us from the League of Women Voters is Kim Sorensen. Kim, good to have you here. Thank you, friend. Good to be here. And great to have all of you at home with us. We begin <clears throat> again in ballot order with the first question. Some purport that Las Cruces is not business friendly and does not provide enough career opportunities. How do you respond to those claims? Mr. Sanchez, we'll begin with you. Uh, I agree 100%. I feel like what we can do to change it is instead of giving grants to businesses that will make Las Cruces look good, what we need to do is we need to get by business friendly, bring more factories and more into the industrial part of Las Cruces where it's more family supporting jobs than instead of just making the downtown look good. So, Mr. Smith. Well, there are multiple number of things that we need to be doing in this area. I think efforts have been carried on by the current city council and I'm certainly proud to have served in that role. But uh, I think looking forward, we need to be looking at how we diversify our economy. This helps us increase the number of opportunities for employers and employees, also increases the number of opportunities for our young people. One of the current issues that we hear about frequently is young people looking elsewhere to find their careers. We want to be sure that Las Cruces is their first choice if they're from here or if they've come here to NMSU. And beyond that, we want to be sure that the city is working with people in the optimal way to make sure that those opportunities and those dreams can happen here. Ms. Solis. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, I believe that uh, we need to start changing some of the regulations that are at the city at the time. Maybe perhaps review some of those uh, that have been, uh, some of the ordinances that have been in place for a number of years and to review those to be able to see how we can begin to entice other people to come into our city to be able to become business friendly and the question was business friendly. And also to be able to uh, for small businesses, I think that we need to work with um, the, the Small Business Development Center and the Chamber of Commerce to, be, to connect those together. I think a lot of times we, we don't build those relationships, and I think building those relationships with those two entities would be beneficial to also grow our, our business here in Las Cruces. Thank you. Mr. Tejas. I spoke to uh, Davin Lopez from uh, Economic Development, and I asked him that question, what do we need to do to grow our business sector here and get good paying jobs in and one of the things he did mention is we need a better permitting system. I looked at a few permitting systems around the country and Phoenix has a what's called a rapid permitting process to where most permits are approved in 24 hours or less. Uh, the larger ones take up to 60 days. We definitely need to get our permitting process in place so where developers, when they come here, they don't go through the frustration of getting a permit and uh, going through that process. One other thing is we need to get uh, friendlier people out in the field. The inspectors, they need to be friendlier to the developers and treat them right and just be respectful to them. Okay. Mr. Baca Fresco. I believe we need to continue to partner with local entities like West that provides um, women entrepreneurs with uh, loans so that they can start to create uh, businesses here for themselves and support the, their families and provide working opportunities for other people in our neighborhood. Okay, Ms. Courtney. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I am a capitalist, a free market person, so I don't like to see the city do government mandates on things like minimum wage. So I think that's hurt us more than anything that I've seen since I've been looking at it. For the last two years, we see this business is vacating the city. 
it especially hurts the food industry, those starter jobs, because uh, they take in beginning workers and they actually train work workers. They're good at workforce development. They already have a really high overhead, so the minimum wage hurt them the most. And um, I remember the Chamber of Commerce two years ago when I ran, uh, Debbie Moore had suggested a one-stop shop for permitting. I think that's great. And I would also advocate at the state level because they put a bunch of rules and regs on us that are unreasonable. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lucero. Thank you for uh, inviting us here today. I'm Jesusita Dolores Lucero, and I'm running for mayor for my past experience, not just on the city council, but also as a banker in this community and a business owner for 11 years in Arroyo Plaza. And when we talk business friendly, we need to know that that means that we can't continue to put more regulation on businesses that are looking at our community. The way business comes here is they look at population, the demographics of that population, and we've grown into a very senior citizen population. And so we need to bring more medical services because that's why uh, seniors are here and we'll need those into the future and baby boomers, of which I'm one. And then um, also career opportunities for our, not just our young, but our middle-aged and our families that are struggling to get a job that can sustain their families. Thank you. Mr. Matisse. Well, thank you again. This is a great opportunity. I really appreciate you doing the forum. Um, I, I think the, the big thing that a city must do uh, to be business friendly is actually to be a business leader. In other words, we probably need to make our process simpler, uh, less restrictions, less regulations, and then look at the neighboring cities and the neighboring states and benchmark if they're getting more businesses in their states and creating more jobs maybe we should do the same. And then we have to look at large businesses and small businesses, and then what I call business uh, clusters, like we're doing real well with the uh, hospital medical field, we're doing now good with telemedicine. Uh, we've expanded into the spaceport industry, we've expanded into the film industry. We just need to make sure that these are supported, and by supporting them, we'll keep our professionals here. We, we won't see them go elsewhere. And so I think if we grow where our professionals stay here, then businesses will grow just as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Miyagashima. Thanks, Fred. How are you doing, Kim? So the first thing, what the city has been doing recently is we uh, did implement the one-stop shop. We also created a position called the business concierge, who basically their job is to uh, have, when a business wants to apply for a permit, to kind of walk through the process, help them overcome those obstacles, uh, we also recently implemented a new computerized planning system, cost over $500,000 so that when a person submits a plan, it goes to the uh, contractor, the city, everyone can make comments and that should help things a lot. But nonetheless, we do have a problem with our inspectors. We're looking to expand that so that one inspector does the entire job from start to finish. As far as business and what can we do to help bring in more businesses, we are focusing on the aerospace. Uh, in fact, NASA iTech was just here a few days ago. Look at Virgin Galactic, Electronic Caregiver, Ganymede Games, uh, PSL NMSU is looking to expand. So we're really uh, focusing on aerospace right now. Thank you. Ms. Ortega. Hello, Fred. Hello, Kim. Thank you so much. My name is Gina Eugenia Montoya Ortega, and I'm co-owner of La Fiesta Bakery. My name is Gina Eugenia Montoya Ortega, and I'm the co-owner of La Fiesta Bakery. The question on not being business friendly. I ran for mayor four years ago, and when I ran, this was the same song that I sang. We are not business friendly. When we opened La Fiesta Bakery, it took us almost two years. Too much red tape, too much bureaucracy. Right now, there's a shortage of inspectors. This is a problem, what business friendly means. When you want to come open a business in Las Cruces, it's difficult. Even to this day, this is something we experienced 15 years ago, and this is something that happens today. I know the subject did come up about the shortage of inspectors. When we had the inspector issues, the inspector would come, inspect you. It takes time to call an inspection out. You get your contractor back out, which takes more time. You call again for a reinspection. Again, it takes another, uh, an, an inspector to get out there. Uh, it takes them a while. And then they send you a new inspector who now finds new issues that the first one did. We need to get these inspectors on the f same page. We need to get the inspectors to follow the same rules. Thank you. Hey, so how will you address concerns of discriminatory employment or housing issues 
for the LGBTQ community? And we'll start with Mr. Smith. Well, thank you for that question. I think one of the things that we know about Las Cruces is this has been a very accepting community, a community that is very open to diversity and to different um, views on life and, and, and those kinds of things. We've got a great ethnic diversity here, and we also have a very welcoming community as far as our LGBTQ population. So I think we've already got a head start on that over a lot of communities, but I also know that we still have some areas where we can be uh, improving. And one of the things that we do at the city, of course, is we have a statement at the city that says that we're not going to discriminate on that basis or a number of other bases. So as we go forward, I think one of the things that we can be doing is looking at more opportunities to make it clear that spouses, regard that, uh, regardless of gender, gender, excuse me, are welcome uh, to participate in the partner or spouse uh, programs uh, in events that we have and making sure that that is part of our normal as far as how we operate. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Solis. Thank you for the question. I think that we should treat people equally. You know, for so long we have just looked at each other and been negative with one another. I think it's time for a community to change. I do know that the uh, city has implemented that resolution, making it a welcoming community. And I appreciate that because we want to be a welcoming community to all, not just to a few, but to everyone that comes into our city. And that should be our goal, to be able to get along with one another and be able to listen to ideas. And I mean, so many people have great ideas. And I think that a lot of times we think that just because they're different, we can't, their ideas don't count and they don't matter. But really, in this community, I think all ideas are welcome. I think we should pursue those and I think that we should be able to see how their ideas can impact our city. Thank you. Mr. Tejas? We need to treat that the same way we treat the laws of all the other laws, uh, race, color, creed, national origin. We need to treat that the same exact way and have the same enforcement on that as we would any other law and treat these people, treat them equal no matter who they are or what they do. As a former businessman, that is that is business 101. You've got to treat everybody equal, no matter what it is. Thank you. Mr. Baca Frescas? I begin by recalling our, um, our state pledge. It says within that pledge that the Zia symbol is a symbol of perfect harmony among diverse cultures. And that is a way that we can reiterate our dedication to diversity in our schools. We do it every day. Uh, we could do it on a larger scale with pride parades annually, as well as um, making sure that non-discrimination clauses are um, across the board, uh, covering all different forms of discrimination, and make sure that that population is included in non-discrimination clauses. Thank you. Ms. Courtney. Um, would you repeat the question, please? Yes. How will you address concerns of discriminatory employment or housing issues for the LGBTQ community? Um, I think that we need to be fair and not base any discrimination or availability of housing on any group. Um, it would be more like poverty level and education and providing opportunities for people the most impoverished people in our community are young families raising children and why do we leave them behind? Because they, we have this poverty level and this unemployment level and that's what I would look at. Ms. Lucero? Thank you. Well, I grew up in the 50s when I was discriminated against for being Hispanic in a community that was of 20,000 people in Las Cruces. So for me, discrimination is just not about anybody, or it should not include anybody. And so whatever group, no matter what their ethnic background, their religious beliefs, their origin, their own gender identification has little to do in my, my viewpoint as to how you're employed, how you uh, receive housing compared to any other group in this community. And so I would be very disappointed to even know that housing and employment discrimination happens in Las Cruces because that's not who we are. 
and we've outgrown that and it's time for us to grow up and accept everybody into our lives. Thank you. Mr. Matisse. You know, as Bill Matisse or as the mayor, I would always have zero, zero tolerance against any and all types of discrimination. Okay, thank you. Mr. or Mayor Miyagashima. Well, thank you. So I'm proud to say that uh, several years ago, I was one of the council members who voted to provide uh, ben partner benefits there in the city of Las Cruces. The city of Las Cruces is a very welcoming community, a great organization to work for. We have at the city level <clears throat> what they call a PRC or policy review committee. And basically what that does is we review different policies throughout the city and how can we better uh, fine tune them. We recognize that uh, although the state may have a landlord tenant act, uh, the city of Las Cruces does not. Uh, that is actually something that the uh, pub, pub policy review committee is working on and we will be including this statement. Okay, thank you. Ms. Ortega. Yes, yeah, so I believe the question was how I would ad address to educate businesses and with housing. Um, so naturally, like, as Ms. Lucero said, that I have also been discriminated based on the color of my skin. And it's really strange to hear that a lot of people have never experienced this. And it's not fun. So I believe the way that you help eliminate this is you educate people. You educate them to know what it is. That's the only way, especially because it's not just at a city level. We're talking about the whole city of Las Cruces. You're talking small businesses, chain stores, uh, p people that have private property. So I believe by educating people, and I know that these communities do reach out and, and you know, they boycott or these companies or these places. So to educate the people to say, you know what, unless you want your business to be uh, boycotted or your, your housing area, I would suggest that, you know what, you educate yourself Thank because you. this is a free country and it's for all of us. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Sanchez. I was lucky to be born in a in an era where discrimination against the LGBTQ community isn't as bad and we are more accepting of them. And as for housing, I am a real estate agent. I have taken classes for property management and we do have the Fair Housing Act, which means we cannot discriminate against pretty much anything here in New Mexico, even gender or your sexuality preference. Um, but uh, well, we, there are loopholes around it. So you can get rejected from renting a home or say from a loan um, based on being judged by the lender or the homeowner. And a way to go around that is we need to get a rejection letter explaining why they are rejected. And if they do qualify in every area and they're still being rejected, that's when we can take it to the Fair Housing Act part and take them to court and figure this out on why they're being rejected. As, and the same for employment because a lot of times you just don't get that call back but you don't know why you're being rejected. We need to start getting more rejection letters from jobs, from home rentals and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question, how best should the city handle the ongoing immigration issues? And we begin with Ms. Solis. Uh, the immigration issue has been a concern for many years. This is not anything new that we've uh, encountered. And I think that immigration, we have laws and policies in place. I think that we need to follow the laws. At the same time, we need to be able to be human, humanitarian and to be able to help and assist those people. Uh, that is just a large topic. I mean, it would require so many answers, so many committees, so many uh, ideas on how this would work for all. It is a deep subject, so it is a federal concern. But at the same time, I think that uh, we need to follow the rule of law. Mr. Taya. I believe we need to follow the rule of law. That's number one. Number two, we have a nonprofit, a large nonprofit entity in this city, and we need to support them and let them handle what they do in the humanitarian area. I don't believe it's something the city should do. I believe it's something the community could do. That is what they do. That's what they're there to do. And we just need, as a city, we need to back up these organizations with the resources they need to not do it when it happens once in a great while, but to be an ongoing practice of theirs, how to handle it every day, such as the gospel rescue mission, places such as that. We just need to back the people up that do it all the time, not just some of the time. <coughs> Mr. Baca Frescas. I agree with a lot of the other uh, candidates. Um, we need to back up our local resources that are providing that service all the time. I also feel that we're we're at a cultural crossroads. Um, historically speaking, Las Cruces and the Camino Real de Adento is one of the oldest roads in this country. It's one of the oldest 
places where diverse cultures were interacting. And it was one of the major routes that people were using for trade throughout Mexico and the United States and before it was even the United States. So I feel that we're in a, in a perfect place to enter the national debate on these issues. And the fact that so many of our family members and friends uh, come from immigration families, um, we have direct experience in the situation here, the contributions that immigrants provide to this community up and down the, um, the Rio Grande Valley. And I feel that by entering that national conversation and talking about the value of immigrants and talking about um, how they deserve to come here because they've been here for as long as they've been, I think that we can move that ball forward. Thank you. Ms. Courtney. Um, the rule of law solves a lot of problems if we just followed the law. I believe in equal justice and equal opportunity, that all men are created equal. I hate to see us have a subculture of slavery. We fought a civil war over slavery, and it looks like they are subsidized labor, and we are the crossroads of the South, as I would say. We have human trafficking here, right here in our town, and we're one of the bigger uh, offenders. I don't think we should turn a blind eye to that. If we want an honest discussion, we have to look at the law and we have to look at actually what's happening to these people. Ms. Lucero. Thank you. Immigration is a very touchy subject for many because we have families that are in different countries and have been separated by that uh, immigration law. My personal experience is my daughter-in-law is not a United States citizen but came into this country legally through my son and a fiance, fiance visa and has been in this country 15 years and she was not coming from a country that was the most heavily populated like Mexico in our border city but from a country that doesn't have a line of immigrants wanting to come to us to New Mexico or to the United States and her process took over two years with something that had no reason to be held up so our immigration issues are based on the law that is broken and needs to be fixed and the city of Las Cruces needs to be a partner in that in changing those immigration laws but we need to follow the rules that are currently in place until those laws are changed. Thank you. Mr. Matisse. Thank you. You know, the eight years experience I had as executive director at the New Mexico Border Authority, I actually witnessed uh, what illegal crossings, the, the impact, the crisis that it created, not only on the, the, the families that were crossing, but then again on the cities. I believe the city of Las Cruces did a great job in, in taking care of, of these people that came in of course, I believe in the law, but you know, the eight years that I was down there, I find that it's better to build uh, bridges than it is barriers. So I think there has to be a congressional change and a reform in immigration. And then, of course, everybody knows I, uh, I'm married to Wanda Matisse, and Wanda is an immigrant. So um, you know, I, I understand the plight that she went through. Thank you. Mayor Miyagashima. Thank you. So this, I'm sure you're aware that the city of Las Cruces was recognized one of 13 heroes during World Humanitarian Day. In fact, the city was the only entity, the rest were individuals. So the city, and I want to take this as a moment to thank all of our faith-based organizations, our partners who, who handled over 17,000 asylum seekers. But I have to point out that when they are brought here, uh, even if it's <clears throat> maybe for a short time, they're brought here by a federal agent. So they're here legally for that short time that they're here until they have their hearing. And so we basically have done it. We handled it. Uh, we worked with our organizations. Um, there were a few uh, other organizations that unfortunately, they were overloaded within three days. They just said, we couldn't do it. We need the city's help. We need to be able to do this. And so I think it's important that we maybe look at acquiring that armory that we currently use for a long-term use for something, whether it's this issue or perhaps another emergency issue that should come about. Thank you. Ms. Ortega. Thank you for the question. So definitely we are all immigrants. My ancestors came over in the 1500s from Spain. So I'm an immigrant and I, and I believe everybody in this room is an immigrant. Uh, finally, I'm really glad that the federal government actually got this right. Had they done their homework at the beginning and stopped these people in the first country that they crossed like they should have, I think this would have alleviated the problem that we started having. Uh, definitely following the laws. What do the laws state about how are we supposed to handle these immigrants? We should continue to do this. 
the city did do what they had to do. However, a lot of people, when I do walk and knock and talk to people, their question is, is how can we help an immigrant, yet we don't help the large population of homeless people and regular veterans that we have. But once again, following the laws, and I, I definitely would be one of those people that would not have wanted these people to just be wandering because if we can help them get through, my husband and my, our, myself, we personally donated about $1,000 in backpacks, chapstick, shoes, um, baked goods. We went and baked for these people. So I understand, like I said, I was an immigrant, and I'm glad that somebody came and helped my ancestors when we came to the United States. Thank you. Mr. Sanchez. All right, this is more of a personal issue for me because I come from a family of immigrants uh, that came here from Mexico and it kind of gets to me that it's at the Washington DC level where they control these laws when it's us here on the borderlands, El Paso, Deming, Las Cruces are the ones that feel the effects. We're the ones that go through it all and my family, my, I'll put my example, my mother when she came over she was afraid to even get a traffic ticket and afraid to go out in public a lot of time because she was scared of being discriminated against or being judged for being an immigrant here in the United States. And I feel like what we can do as a community, what we, what we need to do as a community is we need to be more accepting and we need to be more helping. My whole life I've worked with immigrants, whether they were documented or not, and they are amazing people most of the time. And we need to start being more helpful and yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Thank you, Fred. The situation that we're talking about is a very broad one. We're talking a, a lot about specifics with the people who are seeking asylum, and I do believe the city did the right thing. Uh, but in a broader context, I authored the resolution that the city of Las Cruces sent to our legislators and to people, uh, both the Mexican consul and others, uh, asking our federal government to stop kicking the can down the road and look at what needs to happen as far as the legislation. We don't have laws in place at the moment that are working. Those laws are, as uh, former counselor um, Lucero, sorry, uh, and, I, oh, and I, missed, I mentioned somebody's name, I apologize. It, as was mentioned previously, uh, we don't have, the, the laws currently in place are not working properly, they're broken. And we need somebody to quit kicking the can down the road and focus on the situation, both in the countries where people are originating, whether they're leaving their countries because they're looking for work or they're leaving their countries because they don't feel safe, that's the initial focus. Thank you. That's where it has to happen. Okay, the next question. What steps, if any, would you take to curb actual and potential gun violence in Las Cruces? And we'll start with you, Mr. Tejas. Well, to start with what we need to do is I believe that the chief of police in El Paso, he attributed a lot of the gun violence to mental health issues and drug issues. I believe what we need to do is we need to set up a, system, a facility here that treats mental health conditions at long-term system and a long-term drug rehab facility. We need to take care of the mental health issues of people that could potentially be one of those people that God forbid would go in and do a, such an atrocity. We need to focus on securing our schools first. We need to get uh, even substations in front of these schools during the day mobile and uh, we need to just assure first thing we need to do is make sure our schools are safe and secure and as far as the problem with that we need to focus on mental health. We need to focus on what is causing it. Thank you. Mr. Baca Frescas. Thank you, absolutely. Uh, it's an issue, it's of many, many people's concern lately, uh, especially with the shooting in El Paso. People are frightened, especially in schools and public spaces. Um, I was speaking to a gentleman the other day who was wondering why is it that we haven't put uh, police forces in front of um, other uh, grocery stores that are frequented by Latinos. And on a whole, Gun violence is a form of violence, and so we have to address the cause. We have to address whatever is going on in people's hearts and in their minds that are making them feel desperate, that are making them feel upset, that are making them feel um, displaced or not listened to, and we need to 
do that by taking time in our day <laughs> in the schools to listen to kids in particular. We have to start from a very young age asking them, how are you feeling? How was your day? And get from them what's going on in their life. And also by doing that, we encourage other students in the classroom to listen to them and to empathize with what they're going through. Thank you, Ms. Courtney. Um, I don't have any influence, but I would take that gun-free zone sign off the front of the schools because it's an invitation to every predator. Here's our children and they're helpless. They're weak and helpless. Um, I was just at a law enforcement panel last night and our biggest crime problem is domestic violence related to drugs and alcohol. The next biggest problem is dr crime related to drugs and then mental health. We have a triage center that's been built at least five years and it's sitting there not operational because the officials can't work together with uh, contractors. So there was virtually it, no crime in Las Cruces that has to do with a rifle, an AR-15 or any other style gun actually. Thank you. Ms. Lucero. Well, if you want to take steps in gun violence, you have to read the sentence, which is talking about violence and not about guns. The violence comes from the situation that a person or an individual or a family is in at the time. I think that Las Cruces has increased in poverty over the last 10 years, and in that poverty comes frust frustration, and with that comes extreme measures to get themselves to another place. And I believe that a lot of the gun violence is related to those that need help in a much bigger way than taking their gun from them. Maybe because a lot of times those guns in those hands come from somewhere else in the community. And it's not even been in their home at that time, but they hit a stumbling block, they hit a wall, and they didn't know what else to do. So it's a mental issue that I think has created a big conversation about guns, but we need to focus on the violence. Thank you. Mr. Matisse? Uh, thank you. I, I think the focus should be on, on the violent part and by just expanding programs, whether it's uh, mental health education, uh, just about plain kindness. I think we need to start it in the elementary schools, the junior highs, and then even expand it into the high schools. And all the programs we have from top teens and everything else, I think that has to be addressed. I, th I think sometimes we don't want to bring up violence, we don't want to bring up bad behavior, and maybe we should. And I think if we just expand these programs and actually make them available to all the schools, as well as organizations, businesses, and we do a lot of collaboration between the businesses, between the education systems, between New Mexico State University, the Doniana Community College, I think we can pretty well diminish uh, violence that uh, could happen or will happen in our city. Thank you. Mayor Miyagashima. Thank you. So what we're doing right now, we could do better, but we're trying to expand our community policing. It's very important that the public feels comfortable with our police department because when they see something, of course, and they'll say something. Um, getting some more information on a technology called Shot Spotter, which allows us to find out where shots are being, where there's predominantly more shots in one part of the town as opposed to the other. Uh, hopefully this coming term, if I should be successful, we, don't, we wanna see or elevate uh, the position of a mental health uh, to that of a director there in the city of Las Cruces to recognize and work with our schools. We recognize that there could be some troubled uh, youths, whether teens or, or such, and work with the schools and see exactly how can we uh, provide that type of service or work with our counterparts there at the county uh, to get the service there that they need as a child so hopefully they don't grow up and, and commit other acts. Thank you. I'm sorry, would you ask the question again? Certainly. Because I know we kind of got off every once in a while. What steps, if any, would you take to curb actual and potential gun violence in Las Cruces? So as mayor of Las Cruces, to help curb that, I would ensure that our police department is fully funded and fully staffed. Me as a mayor, I'm not gonna be out there protecting the people. So I believe that that's the job of our police department and in order for them to do their job and do it accurately, we need to make sure they are fully funded and fully staffed. I believe we need to start teaching children about, about what a gun is. Nowadays, the only thing kids know about guns is playing a video game and it's shooting somebody and it's hilarious. There's nothing 
funny about a gun hurting a person. I also believe in community policing. I personally have the police non-emergency number programmed in my phone. And when I see something that does not look right, I don't hesitate to pick up my phone and call them and just say, there's something that doesn't look right over here. I believe that when you start trying to curb that incident from happening, it, it could possibly lead to, you know, maybe this person's possibly going to do something. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sanchez? I was in eighth grade when the Sandy Hook shooting happened. And ever since then, I felt like there just been more mass shootings in the schools. And that did affect me going into high school. Kind of scares you to start going into that school every day, never knowing what's going to happen. And then the, this year on August 3rd, when I saw it happen in El Paso, that's when it hits you hard because that's when it finally affected your community. That's when it's not on the news anymore. It's 30 minutes from here. That's a problem. We, we need to do is we need to start getting more police patrolling the streets. What we need to do is we need to get like NMSU has campus police. We need to put some campus police in the high schools, in the middle schools, in the elementary schools. And that way we can also have the kids get a better perception of the police, um, the police department that we have here because we have very good police officers and that way they have more trust in our police department here and they're also more protected that way. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Yes, last year after the Parkland shooting, uh, we had incidences where people phoned in or texted in threats here in Las Cruces. And I heard from parents and grandparents. One of the grandparents was actually Mark Medoff. Uh, and he and others were talking to me about, what are you going to do about it? And I repeated to them what I had had to say before. Uh, the Article 2, Section 6 of the state constitution pr prohibits municipalities from actually doing anything to prohibit guns. However, what we did decide to do was to ask our state legislators to look at the issue of school safety. That resulted in large numbers of people coming to our city council meeting bearing guns, basically intimidating or trying to intimidate us to uh, <clears throat> steer away from that particular question. The resultant re re uh, excuse me, uh, resolution that we sent to our legislators included several different things, behavioral health, school safety protocols, and a number of things that have been mentioned. But we really wanted to be sure that at the state level they looked at it, and they did. Thank and you. that was something that I was very pleased to see that our state legislators took on. Ms. Solis. Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the law enforcement for the job that they do every day in protecting our city and our communities. I really appreciate that. And as we talk about gun violence, that has a lot to do with, you know, drug and alcohol and all of that. But uh, to me, the bottom line with all of this is, of course, yes, educating. But it goes back to the disrespect that we have in our community. It is a widespread. We don't honor one another. We dis disrespect one another. Even as elected officials, there's a lot of disrespect from the very top all the way down to the local government. And that is what we are teaching our young people to disrespect and to be dishonorable and so then that's the way they speak so they're out there doing things that whatever comes to their mind you know if they feel like they need they can pick up a gun and go shoot Walmart you know they're not thinking clearly so I think that we need to go back to morals and values and begin to respect and honor one another and as we become that example I think that our young people will rise up to the level of that place and realize that gun violence is not healthy Okay, we have time for one more question. What part can the city of Las Cruces play in addressing problems aggravated by climate change and in planning for our best future? Mr. Baca Frescas, we begin with you. Thank you. Um, yesterday morning, a lot of the candidates and I gathered together at the Doniana County Government Building on Motel Boulevard. And while we were there, I was speaking with a lady who said, look around you, look at the tables, look at this publicly um, paid for event. It's covered in plastic bottles, which is a service that's being provided to people that attend that event. But she said, why can't we just get some water coolers? Why can't we provide paper cups so that we're not adding to our carbon footprint, to our pollution of the planet Earth? I think by thinking globally and acting locally, we can make common sense uh, choices like that. Ms. Courtney. Um, I'm originally from Oklahoma and my parents came out of the Dust Bowl and, you know, traditionally Americans would prepare for disaster and climate change is part of li our life, part of my grandparents' life, their grandparents' life, and so 
A wise person has extra food storage and can be independent and take care of themselves if there is a catastrophe. And I'll, not only that, you want to be able to take care of your neighbors and to be able to help people. So if you come from a strong position, you, you know, you will be able to do that. There's a lot of controversy on the science. One of my good friends is called the data guy. He was the atmospheric science uh, career man in the Air Force. And he refutes that science. I think it's, it scares people and makes them be unreasonable. Ms. Lucero. Thank you. Climate change has been a big discussion across this nation and it's gonna take not just Las Cruces but many more communities across New Mexico and our, and our United States of America. Climate change is something that uh, I see the city of Las Cruces taking some positive steps in solar panels and different uh, in it, uh, amenities to the buildings. But with that also comes, we have to also know that we live in a farming community and our farming community is, they don't want a climate change that's gonna ruin the crops that we rely on to eat and, and use our cotton and everything else that comes from it. So we need to be very supportive of that and know that with that, we also will wanna protect our food and our products that are, are here in this community outside the city limits, but it's a vital part of our community. Mr. Matisse. I'm just going to mention a American, Native American quote that I came across that I really like. It says, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. So keeping that in mind, I think each and every one of us here and in the community, we need to do the best that we can actually use all the uh, features that are available from solar, from wind, uh, to actually maybe save this planet for our children. Thank you. Mayor, Mayor Shimia. In 2007, no city building had solar. In 2008, in my first State of the City address, I talked about sustainability. From that point forward, almost all of our buildings that are new construction have solar uh, panels or solar um, capability. Um, we're also, I also want to point out that my latest or last, uh, or 2019, hopefully it's not my last, uh, my 2019 State of the City address in February, half of it, I talked about climate change. And so one of the things we're looking at doing, of course, is um, electric vehicles. Uh, we just recently, um, we're very proud of this, are using methane gas there at the sewer department, our sewer plant, to help generate power to uh, sustain itself as well. So City of Las Cruces is doing quite a bit when it comes to sustainability and recognizing that that does affect and or helps prevent, um, or, you know, contributes to helping our, our climate and, and the change that, we're, that is occurring. Thank you. Ms. Ortega. So as mayor, I would definitely, um, there's a lot of people that would love to invest in solar. However, it's something very expensive. And uh, El Paso Electric, from what I understand from people, it's not very friendly to the people that do have solar panels. So I believe as a city, we need to step in and help those people that would like to have solar panels be able to work more friendly with um, El Paso Electric. We could also use the methane gas that comes from our landfills. We can use that to power, use electricity. Uh, a lot of people, when I, I've been walking and talking to people, they address the fact that um, why do we, our city vehicles, we have a big F-250 pickup, you know, for our maintenance guy that's coming to do whatever, or even the person that's checking our meter, they obviously don't need all the tools. So why aren't more of our vehicles now being purchased that are more friendly to actually to the environment? Um, I've actually met a company that um, they are interested in coming and helping with us recycling uh, everything that we have and also wind and solar, uh, wind turbines that are friendly to animals. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sanchez. I feel like we need to stop using climate change as a talking point and we just need to get something done already because the timer is really running out. And especially for my generation, we're the ones that are gonna inherit all the problems that the past generations have left us. We're the ones inheriting everything and we're the ones that need to get something done now. Uh, we have gone forward with the solar power. We also need to start cleaning the pollution in the desert um, all the plastic waste. We need to start a recycling program here where we use the plastic bottles and all the things we recycle to our benefit because at the moment we're sending it to a company where 75% of it ends up in landfills and that's not helping climate change out at all still. 
So what we need to do is we need to start a recycling program. We need to start reporting illegal dumping. We cannot put up with that either anymore. We need to get something done now because if not, my kids won't have a future. Mr. Smith. Let me start on a personal level. I've owned a hybrid vehicle since 2003. I'm on my third one. It's a plug-in. So I'm trying to do that at a personal level, but I think the city also needs to be setting an example. And we are doing that with some electric buses that are coming. Also, I have been emphasizing connecting downtown with NMSU and the convention center with electric buses that uh, can then cut down on the carbon footprint. Also, uh, one of my constituents, Margaret Bernstein, has been talking with me for a long time about what we can do as far as uh, urban forests, what we can do to concentrate the cooling effect and the oxygen exchange that will help at the local level. Uh, so there are things along those lines that we can be doing more of here at the city of Las Cruces. And I'm very interested in doing that uh, and very interested in us continuing with the low, um, LED lights, the solar collectors, and the other things that will help us reduce our carbon footprint. <coughs> Excuse me, carbon footprint. Ms. Solis. Thank you. Uh, climate change, I believe that it, it involves a lot of preparedness, and I do believe that uh, I agree with solar panels as, far, as long as it's in, implemented uh, in a financial sound way. Uh, we also have a recycling, uh, the Solid Waste Authority, they do recycling, and we also have illegal dumping that the county has implemented as well. So we do have those two programs already in Las Cruces. I think that we just educating and just preparing for the climate change. I think that we all need to be prepared, even uh, for just having a, some, a box in your closet, you know, with a flashlight and just, just simple things like that, that can prepare us for whatever may happen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. I think one of the first things we need to do is we need to take care of the recyclables that we do have here and that we do gather in, I believe, Coralitas. Um, we need to invite companies in that will convert the plastics, for instance, the 3D ink, uh, get the glass, recycle it into a landscape materials. We need to take all the recyclables that we are presently gathering and start doing something with them so that they don't become a mountain here or in the landfill somewhere else. We have a sustainability office here. If they're doing a good job, we need to work with them and keep going forward with it. Thank you very much. We thank all of the candidates for joining us for this Las Cruces Mayoral Forum. Early voting is underway, and we want to thank the League of Women Voters of Southern New Mexico, and thank you, Kim, for being with us. My pleasure. We also want to thank PFLAG and the NAACP. Want to remind you as well, to go to krwg.org at the top of the page. You will find all the information about ranked choice voting and an entire show about the issue as well with our county clerk. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Thank you for being with us.